A few days have passed since I was thrust into this strange world by one of those damned portals. As I slowly adjust, I've encountered various peculiar beasts and creatures that inhabit this place. Upon my unexpected arrival, I found myself in the midst of a Garu tribe, or werewolves, as I'm more familiar with. Understandably, they were none too pleased with my sudden appearance in their territory. After a tense standoff, we eventually reached an understanding. Perhaps they recognized something in my Witcher blood, or decided that I wasn't worth the trouble. Whatever the reason, I've been allowed to stay and learn from them. As I continue to document my findings in this journal, I hope this knowledge will not only help me better understand this foreign world, but also aid in my search for a way back to my own realm. For now, I'll make the most of my time here, absorbing all I can about the Garu and their customs. As a Witcher, it's crucial to be prepared for any challenges that may lie ahead, and understanding this new world and its inhabitants is the key to survival. Before I discuss the nuances of the Garu and their culture, I feel as though I should discuss the differences between the werewolves of my own world and the ones of this world. First and foremost, in my world, werewolves are victims of a curse. However, the Garu see their nature as a blessing, despite the burdens that come with it. They are not cursed, nor are they infected by a bite. Werewolves are born, not made. Secondly, werewolves where I come from can only change forms under a full moon. In reality, they can shift whenever they choose, although some circumstances can force them to shift against their will. Additionally, the full moon does not turn them into mindless beasts, but it can trigger a bestial fury that can cause them to lose control of their emotions. A misconception in this world is that werewolves can only be vanquished by projectiles made of silver. In my world, firearms are crude at best and nowhere near as advanced as they have become here. Regardless, silver remains a significant weakness for werewolves, whether in the form of a bullet or other weapons, similar to the werewolves from my home. They possess remarkable regenerative capabilities, but they don't heal instantaneously, and wounds inflicted by silver take considerably longer to mend compared to those caused by other materials. Finally, there is the belief that werewolf packs work like wolf packs with alphas, betas, and omegas. While there is some truth to this, most werewolf packs are not family units like wolf packs, and they establish a hierarchy that comes naturally to them when they come together to fight against the forces of evil. During my time at the tribe, a galliard named Moonsong Weaver, a storyteller and one of the keepers of history for Garu Kind, told me about their origins. Long ago, the Garu were created by Gaia to be the world's protectors, passing down their gifts to their children. They mated with humans and wolves, trying to teach humanity to live in harmony with the world and to find balance. However, the Garu became aggressive in policing humanity during the Impergium, a time of violence and terror. This led to humanity becoming terrified of the wilderness and wolves, which prompted them to gather in settlements for safety. Some werewolves believed that it was the Garu who pushed humanity into settlements to keep a better eye on their breeding stock, and that if not for the Garu, Humanity might still be a nomadic species. Once humanity realized they could build walls to keep the Garu out, the Garu stepped up their Impergium, which not only affected humans, but also other Pharah as well. Unbeknownst to the Garu, humanity had learned about their weakness to silver, allowing humans to push back and fight against their would-be masters. Eventually, the Garu agreed to leave humanity to its own devices and maintain their society separate from that of humans. The werewolves formed the Western Concordiate, and the Impergium ended. However, humanity still remembers the Garu, and has an instinctive fear of the night and the monsters that lurk in it. The truth of these stories, as recounted by Moonsong Weaver, remains unclear as the Garu's history is part legend and part oral tradition. I've seen many things and heard countless stories, but this tale of the Garu's origins and their relationship with humanity made me ponder the complex web of interactions between different beings in this world. I could sense the unease in Moonsong Weaver about discussing this war of rage, a dark chapter in the history of her kind and a mark of shame to most Garu on their legacy. Not unlike the conflicts in my own realm, the war of rage stemmed from a deep-rooted desire for power and control. It seems that regardless of the world, the struggle for dominance inevitably leads to devastating consequences. This ancient war began when tensions among the Farah tribes reached a breaking point. The Garu, considering themselves the protectors of the world and appointed by Gaia, believed they were entitled to greater power and authority over all other Farah. When their demands for the powers granted to other races by Gaia were denied, 
They declared war, leading to mass massacres, genocide, and the extinction of several breeds. It's crucial to note that there was no single trigger for this war. Rather, a combination of circumstances led to the chaos. The Garu ultimately emerged victorious, but their victory may have cost them everything. Ill-equipped to carry out the roles of the other Pharah, they inadvertently allowed the worm to gain a foothold in the world. Meanwhile, humanity was discovering its own strength and voice. As I listened to Moonsong recount the events of the war, I found myself reflecting on the implications of her story. Having dedicated my life to hunting monsters and safeguarding humans from the darkness that inhabits our world, I couldn't help but see parallels between my own calling and the Garu's original purpose, even if our methods differed. Their intent to maintain the natural balance seemed honorable, but the violence of the Impergium and the seemingly futile War of Rage were disconcerting. I was uncertain whether the Garu harbored any remorse or guilt for their past actions. To what extent did they care about humanity as a whole? Did they regret the consequences of the War of Rage? It was difficult to gauge the depth of their emotions or their level of concern for humans and their fellow Pharah based on my limited interactions with them. I suspected that I would not receive candid answers from my hosts if I delved deeper into these questions, so I opted to continue listening to Moonsong's account of their history. In this world, I've found that human civilization has far surpassed anything I've ever encountered in my own realm. The sprawling cities here dwarf those I've known, and their technology seems to be centuries ahead of ours. It amazes me to see such progress. Yet, I can't help but feel a tinge of sadness as I observe that the vast majority of this world's inhabitants remain blissfully unaware of the supernatural forces that coexist alongside them. It's astonishing to see how concepts such as magic and monsters have been relegated to the realm of fiction and stories. Werewolves, fascinatingly, are creatures of many worlds. I admire their ability to walk among humanity undetected and blend in, albeit temporarily. They can assume the forms of wolves, run with a pack, and hunt the remaining game, all the while singing their love to the moon. The Garu have their own rich culture, steeped in an oral tradition and a complex society that traces back to the dawn of time. From my perspective, most werewolves seem to comfortably navigate these different worlds, although some may prefer living as humans. I can understand how such a life can be rife with frustrations. With over seven billion humans inhabiting this world, werewolves can attempt to live among them, but modern cities present numerous dangers for the Guru. I can empathize with their struggle, as the unnatural environment awakens their primal instincts, and the combination of overpopulation, artificial materials, and pollution creates a nightmarish landscape for these creatures. A werewolf might try to seek solace in nature, but due to ecological devastation, the wilderness is rapidly shrinking. I share the Garu's pain in being aware of the dwindling number of wild wolves on the planet. Ordinary people often vilify wolves, casting them as antagonists in children's tales, and perceive them as threats to farmers and prey for hunters. I find this attitude disheartening, especially when considering that once, wolves were among the most widespread mammals in the world. But now, after centuries of overhunting and persecution, only a few regions can boast healthy wolf populations. There is no refuge left for the wolf, and I cannot ignore the injustice they face. Werewolves face a constant struggle for survival, caught between worlds and forced to choose between two extremes, hunting in urban wastelands or navigating the ever-changing wilderness. No matter where they choose to live, werewolves must confront the harsh reality of their existence and adapt to the challenges that lie ahead. The nature of werewolves is dual, balancing between wolf and human, city and wilderness, duty and passion, and rage and gnosis. I find this balance fascinating, as rage is their raw fury, fueling their victory in battles and their fight against the worm. This makes them volatile and unpredictable, particularly in a world plagued by ecological catastrophe. Gnosis, on the other hand, represents their spiritual connection, enabling them to commune with spirits and learn their gifts. However, neglecting the equilibrium between rage and gnosis can result in a werewolf becoming lost in the umbra, ultimately losing their physical form. Werewolves are both warriors and mystics who battle and perish for their convictions. I appreciate their use of diverse tactics such as deception, political activism, and intrigue to combat abominations and hunt down evil straddling two realms, the physical and the spiritual. Werewolves face a somber fate as their world withers away. Many werewolf seers warn that these are the final days and that the end times have come. Despite this prophecy, werewolf champions are prepared to sacrifice everything to stave off the encroaching darkness. 
As an outsider looking in, I feel a deep sense of admiration for the werewolves' courage and resilience in the face of adversity. Yet at the same time, it's hard to ignore that their struggles seem to be the consequences of their own actions. Their ability to navigate the complexities of both human and supernatural worlds demonstrates a level of adaptability that is truly remarkable. However, it also makes me ponder whether a different approach or a greater understanding of their own nature could have led to a different outcome. Over the past few months, I've gained a deeper understanding of how werewolves increase their numbers and initiate their young. As previously mentioned, werewolves in this realm differ significantly from those in my world. The belief that a werewolf bite transforms someone into one of their kind is nothing more than a myth. Werewolves are born, not created descending from other werewolves. Unaware of their heritage until puberty, that's when they experience their first transformation. It is impossible to predict if a child born from a union between a werewolf and a human or wolf will become a garu. While a child of two werewolves is always a garu, such a mating breaches the litany and causes complications. Kinfolk, the offspring of werewolves who can be human or wolf, carry the werewolf gene. Some tribes revere and protect their kinfolk, while others see them as mere breeding stock. Due to the declining wolf population, wolf kinfolk are highly valued, and tribes are often willing to fight for them. A spirit observer, the Kin Fetch, watches over human kinfolk to alert the Garu if they ever transform, but this system is not foolproof. In Garu society, a cub refers to a werewolf who has not yet experienced the first change or accepted their Garu status. Typically occurring around sexual maturity, the first change often results in intense emotional responses, social difficulties, and peculiar obsessions. During this transformation, werewolves release a lifetime of pent-up frustration, rage, and repressed emotions. If fortunate, a werewolf or pack will be nearby to subdue them. If not, a cub can find themselves killing those close to them or causing unnecessary destruction around them. Specialized packs assigned to manage newly transformed Garu are scarce, causing some cubs to disappear or live in a state of bestial madness. In some cases, a Garu can rescue or abduct a cub before the change takes place. After undergoing the first change, a werewolf prepares for the rite of passage, a quest that pushes their strength and wisdom to the limit. The cub must learn about Garu customs and the various tribes before choosing a tribe to join. Some tribes have predetermined membership, as cubs may be purebred into a specific tribe. Upon completing the rite of passage, the cub becomes a Clioth, formally joining their tribe and learning their first tribal gifts. The quest can be undertaken alone or with other cubs, involving a solitary vision quest or a gathering of many werewolves. As I observe the werewolves first change and rite of passage, I can't help but draw parallels between their experiences and my own transformation into a witcher. The first change, a critical and emotionally charged turning point in a young guru's life, reminds me of the pain and struggle I faced during the trial of the grasses. The volatile emotions and physical changes they endure resonate with the challenges I've confronted in reconciling my humanity with my monstrous aspects. The rite of passage, much like my own witcher training, tests the young Garu's strength, wisdom, and resilience. Their journey to prove themselves and find their place within a tribe mirrors the rigorous trials I had to overcome to become a skilled monster hunter. Despite the differences between our worlds, the shared journey of self-discovery, growth, and acceptance evokes a sense of kinship between me and the Garu. When you first look at werewolves, or the Garu as they call themselves, it's easy to lump them all together, but spend some time among them, and you'll quickly realize that they're as varied as the humans and wolves they spring from. The Garu come from three distinct breeds, Homid, Lupus, and Metis. Each one is unique, shaped by where they came from and who raised them. Homids, the ones born from humans, often have a hard time fitting in among their kin. They've spent their lives among people, and suddenly they're thrust into a world they never knew existed. They may struggle, but they bring something valuable to the table, a connection to humanity, and a unique set of gifts like creativity, adaptability, and a type of intelligence that allows them to see things from different perspectives. It's a double-edged sword, though. Lose sight of their lupine nature, and they risk becoming unbalanced. Then there are the lupus, born from wolves or kinfolk wolves. They're a rare breed, and they face their own set of challenges. Living in human society is like navigating a labyrinth for them. But what they lack in understanding human norms, they make up for with their deep, innate connection to nature. They have gifts that enhance their natural abilities, letting them perform feats that homids can only dream of. And lastly, there's the Matis, 
the offspring of two werewolves. Marked by their deformities and sterility, they're often treated as pariahs, especially by certain tribes like the Red Talons and the Fianna. Despite their struggles, they have a unique set of gifts of their own. The spirits have granted them abilities that range from manipulating the elements to burrowing through the earth. They can even twist their flesh in ways that can give them an edge in a fight. All in all, the Garu are a diverse lot. Understanding them, their struggles, and the unique gifts they bring to the table is crucial if I want to navigate the world they live in. And who knows, understanding them might just help me understand the world a bit better. During the past few days, we've exchanged knowledge about our abilities. I demonstrated the Witcher signs and techniques. In return, they shed light on their gifts as well as revealed the various forms they could assume. The powers that the Garu wield called gifts are not to be taken lightly. These aren't mere trinkets handed out freely, but powerful blessings bestowed by spirits. Each gift carries a weight, a responsibility to use it for the cause of Gaia, the very Earth herself. Gifts are extremely varied and dependent on your breed, auspice, and tribe. As a Witcher, I am familiar with the use of elixirs and signs, but these gifts, they're something else entirely. They range from basic abilities to the strongest, the stuff of legends only accessible to the most revered of the Garu. It's a steep climb, and every new rank earned unlocks a whole new set of gifts. Earning a gift isn't simple. It's not like picking up a new sword technique or learning the ingredients of a potion. It involves a communion with spirits, an act of humility, of submission, often within the sanctum of a cairn. However, as these sacred places dwindle, the Garu have to be flexible. This isn't traditional learning. It's a melding, a fusion of the Garu's essence with that of a spirit, granting them a fragment of its power. It's not a drawn-out process, but the implications are lifelong. Garu teaching each other gifts, that's a tricky business. The bond it requires isn't for the faint-hearted. It's a gray area, treading on the thin line of the litany, their sacred laws. Once a gift is earned, it's there for keeps. It becomes a part of them, as natural as breathing. There are tales of spirits taking back their gifts, but those are rare. More often, it seems the Garu prefer to handle justice on their own terms, especially in these troubling times. To them, gifts are more than just powers. They're a testament to their dedication to Gaia, a symbol of their place in this war. And trust me, in a war, every advantage counts. Werewolves have five distinct forms, Hamid, Glabro, Hispos, Lupus, and Krinos. A werewolf's breed form is the one they are most at ease in, as it corresponds to their upbringing. For instance, Hamid werewolves favor their human form due to their familiarity with human society. In contrast, Lupus werewolves feel most comfortable in their wolf form, having been raised by wolves and possessing a deep connection to nature. The Glabro and Hispo forms, though not birth forms for Garu, serve important functions. Glabro, or the near-man form, allows a werewolf to somewhat blend in with humans while harnessing some of their feral power. The Hispo form, the near-wolf, resembles a nightmarish, massive wolf from the times of prehistoric dire wolves the size of ponies, tailored for hunting and killing. The Krinos form, situated between Hamid and Lupus, is the birth form of Metis werewolves. In this form, werewolves stand on two legs and reach a staggering nine feet in height, instilling terror in those who encounter them. However, transforming into Krinos is a painful and arduous process, typically reserved for battle. Werewolves often stick to their breed form, the one they were born and raised in, despite their ability to shift freely between forms. As they gain experience, they can perform more subtle transformations, like partially shifting into another form. Each form embodies unique aspects of Garu society with its own strengths and weaknesses. Observing the Garu society's internal dynamics, IT contemplate the duality of existence they experience. Homid Garu, with their human upbringing, strive to integrate into a society that's as foreign to them as a wolf amongst humans. Lupus werewolves, with their profound connection to the wild, struggle to navigate the labyrinth of human society. And the Metis werewolves, trapped in the paradox of their birth, strive to find their footing in a world that seems to reject their very existence. This vivid demonstration of survival and adaptation, of attempting to reconcile conflicting identities, serves as a potent mirror to the societal challenges we face in our own world underscoring the necessity for understanding and coexistence. Delirium is a phenomenon that occurs when a human sees a werewolf in their Krinos form, causing them to experience overwhelming fear and madness. 
This is due to suppressed racial memories of the distant past when werewolves hunted and culled human herds systematically for thousands of years. The delirium prevents the horror of the primeval world from returning, as humans never see Krinos Garu as they truly are. Instead, they rationalize their sightings away instinctively, concocting elaborate and horrific stories about what they thought they saw. Perhaps this is one of the reasons I was not immediately attacked when I appeared in this Garu tribe as this phenomenon had no effect on me. Even though from an initial glance I look human, but maybe due to my witcher blood, it must have a lesser effect. Although the fear of the delirium offers protection for the Garu, they cannot afford to take chances. Werewolves who cause the delirium without good reason are punished severely or exiled. Since the creation of the Western Concordiant, werewolves have kept their existence secret, maintaining the veil. The illusion that the primitive supernatural world no longer exists. Even the slightest chance that a werewolf shapeshifting was caught on film can cause trouble. And werewolves and their human kin will do everything possible to ensure that such footage doesn't see the light of day. Kinfolk who possess Garu blood are unaffected by the delirium and see their werewolf relatives as they truly are. Therefore, the veil doesn't always apply to them, and many kinfolk choose to work with their werewolf relatives. However, some kinfolk become resentful that they are only called upon when needed and are not considered true Garu. During my time with the Garu tribe, I found myself in a situation that demonstrated the power of the delirium. On a dark moonlit night, I joined a group of werewolves in pursuit of a dangerous creature terrorizing a nearby village. We weren't the only ones tracking it, however. A group of human hunters had followed the trail as well. As we closed in on the creature, the werewolves realized the humans would witness their transformation into Krinos form. They had no choice but to reveal themselves, lest the beast wreak further havoc on the village. I stood back as the werewolves shifted into their fearsome Krinos forms, and the delirium took hold of the human hunters. Panic and madness gripped them as they attempted to rationalize the sight before them. Some dropped their weapons and fled, while others froze in terror or turned on each other. Though I am not easily affected by the supernatural, delirium's raw, primal power was striking. My witcher blood granted me immunity to its effects, and I couldn't help but appreciate the advantage it afforded me. Together with my Garu allies, we continued the pursuit and ultimately vanquished the creature, safeguarding the village. The incident with the human hunters served as a stark reminder of the delicate balance werewolves must maintain, concealing their existence to ensure the safety of both their kind and the human world. Witnessing the delirium and its impact on the human psyche was a sobering experience, deepening my understanding of the intricate, hidden world of the Garu. I've observed a stark contrast between the werewolves I've faced in my world and those I've encountered here. In my realm, those afflicted with lycanthropy transform into werewolves solely during the full moon. However, in this realm, each moon phase holds immense significance, affecting werewolves' interactions with the world from birth. Upon birth, a werewolf inherits a legacy molded by their breed and later by their tribe as they combat the worm. Their role in Garu society is determined by their auspice, which corresponds to the moon phase during their birth. Each of the five auspices represents a specific role in Garu society and bestows its own set of mystical gifts. Werewolves reach their peak strength when the moon's phase aligns with their auspice, but they also become more susceptible to bouts of rage during this period. The Ragabash. They're an odd lot, even among the werewolves. Born under the new moon, they're the jesters, the tricksters, the ones who thumb their noses at tradition just to see if there's a better way. Might seem disrespectful, even harmful, but they do it for the good of the Garu. Not every decision needs their humor and sharp-eyed questioning, but those that do, they dissect with precision. In the thick of battle, they're cunning, unpredictable. They draw enemies into traps, strike when it's least expected, scouts and tacticians who don't play by the usual rules. Luna's gifts to the Ragabash defy tradition and conventional wisdom. Their gifts include the ability to blur their form, making them a tough target, and a talent for spreading infectious laughter that can diffuse tensions or manipulate situations. They have a knack for bypassing locked devices and can intercept communications from the weaver's web, providing them with a significant tactical edge. As they mature, they can shapeshift into any creature from the size of a small bird to a bison, offering them versatility in their covert operations. Their capacity to steal powers from others, converting them into their own gifts, is particularly intriguing and can prove devastating in combat. Spirits like the deceptive chameleon, coyote, fox, and spider are their mentors 
along with spirits of disease, pain, and the primal force of the world, the wild. It's this unique mix of abilities, earned through spiritual favor, that makes the Ragabash a formidable opponent and an invaluable ally. They've got more freedom than the others, more room to explore paths that other Garu wouldn't dare tread. It leads to some unwelcome truths, no doubt, but oftentimes it brings something worthy to the table. They've got this way of lightening the mood, diffusing tension, even if it means risking a brawl with one of the humorless Aruns. They aren't afraid to stir the pot, do something that might not sit well with the others. They embody the trickster spirit, after all. And despite everything, I can't help but respect that. They question, they challenge, and in doing so, they keep their kin from growing complacent. Annoying? Yes. Essential? Absolutely. Thurges. Now there's a breed apart. Born under the crescent moon, these are the werewolves who've got one foot in the here and now, the other in the beyond. The mystics of their kind, with a tie to the umbra, and its spirits deeper than any other Garu can fathom. That sickle-shaped moon they're born under, it gifts them a kind of insight. Let's them peer into the shadowy nooks of the spirit world and grapple with the secrets lurking there. Some might dismiss them as mere daydreamers, but that's a shallow view. They exist between realities, simultaneously rooted in the physical and the spiritual. Their array of gifts largely centers around healing and interfacing with the spirit realm. Healing wounds with a mere touch, sensing and trapping ethereal entities, and even commanding these spirits to their will. These skills set them apart. Furthermore, their ability to traverse the Umbra, the spirit world, without drawing undue attention from hostile spirits is nothing short of impressive. Their power doesn't stop at mere interaction. Some Theurges possess the rare and formidable ability to alter the very essence of spirits, a task that holds profound responsibility and potential consequences. The potency of these gifts is not absolute. It can fluctuate with varying circumstances. But when they work, the impact can range from miraculous healings to more insidious effects like permanently diminishing a target's intellect or altering their deeply held beliefs. Thurges, with their spiritual mastery, undeniably hold a vital place within Garu society. They tend to be a bit distant, lost in thought, removed from their packmates. But that doesn't mean they're less valuable. Far from it. They serve as a reminder of the spiritual half of their nature, their visions, their dreams. They guide the rest of the Garu, keep them from getting too lost in the physical, the tangible. Without Thurge, the werewolves would be adrift, aimless. They might not always be understood, might not always fit in, but they're a lighthouse in a storm, a beacon that prevents their kin from losing their way, a crucial part of the whole, whether the rest of the pack always sees it or not. Philodox, the werewolves born under the half moon, are an interesting lot. They stand for the balance, the duality that defines their kind. They're the middle ground, the peacemakers, the voices of reason amidst the howls of their pack. It's their task to interpret the laws of the Guru, to uphold them. Not an easy task, but someone's got to do it, and they do it well. They're always looking for the fair way out, balancing the wants of one against the needs of many. They're known for their sense of duty, their honor, their responsibility. It's a heavy burden they bear, but they bear it willingly. They're the ones who decide whether a wayward Guru deserves punishment, or if a werewolf's actions merit praise and reward. Their gifts, as one might expect, echo this responsibility. Philodox's gifts enable them to discern truth from falsehood, to maintain a harmonious balance between cosmic forces, and to uphold the sacred laws that bind the Guru together. In times of peace, they often take the lead. Their balanced judgment and wisdom make them natural leaders, but when the drums of war start to beat, they know when to step aside to let the Arun, the warriors, or the Galliard, the heart of the pack, take charge. They're not the loudest or the fiercest, but they're the steady hand that guides the pack, keeping it from veering too far off course. Galliards, the werewolves born under the gibbous moon, they're the heart, the soul of their kind. With their knack for artistry, their penchant for storytelling, they hold the power to inspire, to fuel the spirit of the pack. They're the historians, the keepers of the old ways, recounting the tales of the tribes of the Garu. It's through their songs, their performances, that they lift the spirits of their comrades, reminding them of their sacred duty, their purpose as Gaia's guardians. They've been granted gifts that allow them to master the realms of dream, fantasy, and emotion, a tapestry woven in service to Gaia. With their capacity to communicate with the creatures of the wild, they can also emit howls that carry deep emotion, 
a unique method of communication that can influence others on a profound level. Their gifts also permit them to manipulate the dreams of others, imbuing them with their own concoctions of thought and vision. They can even create minor moon bridges, crafting pathways through the spirit world. The ability to shape dreams, to breathe life into them and instill them into sleeping minds, reminds me of tales spun by the most skilled bards. However, the Galliards take it a step further, manifesting dream creatures into existence. Their more potent gifts, it seems, allow them to manipulate the emotions of others, effectively painting their own emotional landscapes onto the consciousness of others. They can even sever bonds, much like the Philodox gift. They're the balm to the pack's anger, a voice of caution for the reckless ones, an agent of balance. In the face of war, these galliards step up, rallying their pack, leading them into the fray. They honor the fallen, the ones who've made the ultimate sacrifice. They might not be the strongest or the most feared, but they're the glue that holds the pack together. Their songs, their tales, they're the beat to which the guru march, the rhythm that fuels their fight. The Arun. Werewolves born under the glaring gaze of the full moon, they're the epitome of warriors. True champions among a race of fighters, living weapons forged by Gaia herself. Their purpose is clear, to kill, to die for the cause, always ready for the next fight. Their strength is a thing of respect, their deadly instincts a source of fear. Even a freshly changed Arun, still finding their footing, can outmatch many battle-hardened warriors of other moon signs. The thought of an elder Arun. One who's survived countless battles sends shivers down the spine. Their accumulated experience, their battle scars, they're a testament to their sheer tenacity, their undying will. Like the Galliard, they lead during war, but it's through action, not words. They're the vanguard, the ones to plunge headfirst into the fray and the last to withdraw, if they ever do. Their skills are an extension of their ferocity and resilience, sharpening their innate combat abilities. The Arun possess an array of potent abilities that make them formidable opponents and inspiring leaders. They can channel their rage into terrifying physical displays, knocking enemies sprawling with a mere touch, honing their claws to razor sharpness, and even transforming their claws into barbed spurs or precious silver. Their combat prowess is further enhanced by their ability to ignore enemy armor, rapidly heal even in the heat of battle, and maintain a punishing grip on their foes with their teeth. Moreover, they can ignite any part of their bodies, rendering them immune to flames and adding fiery power to their attacks. In addition to their physical prowess, Arun carry the mantle of leadership, their presence alone inspiring their comrades and improving coordination in battle. They can sense the presence of silver, the bane of their kind, and shield themselves from spiritual attacks. Their uncanny reflexes allow them to strike first in a fray, and their terrifying presence can intimidate foes into inaction. They have learned to master their own fury, suppressing their rage to avoid frenzy. Furthermore, they can call upon the full moon to illuminate their enemies, disrupting stealth and invisibility. Arun also possess the ability to alter their physical form and can imbue their allies with extra willpower, pushing it beyond normal limits. Their ultimate gift, though, is their remarkable resilience, enabling them to heal even the most grievous wounds unless inflicted by silver. In times of peace, they may step back, allow others to take the reins, but make no mistake, they remain vigilant, ready. They know their skills, their prowess will be called upon sooner rather than later. They're not just warriors, they're guardians, protectors living on the edge of a blade, always poised for the next battle. For the Garu nation's overall strength, it is crucial that werewolves fulfill their roles in society. However, they must also be mindful of the dangers associated with their auspice particularly during the corresponding moon phase when they are more susceptible to the frenzy of rage. As I sit listening to Moonsong Weaver's explanation of the spirit world, I feel a strange sense of awe mixed with unease. The spirit world Moonsong Weaver describes is far more elaborate and structured than anything I've encountered before. In my world, the divide between the physical and the supernatural is a lot less defined. Ghosts, wraiths, and other spectral beings are typically encountered in the same physical realm, not in a separate, mirrored spiritual world. But I've always sensed there's more to the world than meets the eye, a layer of reality that remains unseen and unexplored. The umbra gives a form to that intuition. Stepping sideways to traverse between physical and spiritual realms is an interesting concept, akin to the portals mages use in my world, though those portals merely cover physical distances, not dimensional ones. The ability to interact with spirits in a realm that mirrors our own has potential for knowledge and insight, but I suspect it also holds many dangers. 
The concept of the gauntlet as a barrier between the physical and spiritual worlds is thought-provoking, and the idea of the periphery, where spiritual energy seeps through, resonates with my experiences. There have been times, in certain places or situations, when I felt a heightened connection to the world around me, a sense that there's more at play than the physically evident. The dark umbra, a realm of decay, suffering and death, is troubling. It's a grim reminder of the despair and torment that can persist even after death. Though it's unsettling, it can offer resolution to spirits trapped in eternal suffering. It's a grim kind of mercy. The astral realm, a domain of pure intellect, and the various smaller pocket dimensions scattered across the penumbra, each with their unique rules and inhabitants, are fascinating. It's like peering into a multitude of different worlds, each with their own mysteries to unravel. The near umbra and its major realms, each with their unique characteristics, offer incredible opportunities for exploration and growth although I have no doubt each holds its own perils too. The deep umbra, the realm beyond the membrane, sounds both intriguing and terrifying. A realm where reality breaks down, where even the presence of Gaia is less perceptible is beyond my comprehension. It's a chilling thought to imagine venturing into such a realm, to confront the weaver, wild, and worm in their domain. Yet it's also thrilling in a strange way. As Moonsong concludes her explanation, I pondered on this newfound knowledge. The spirit world is a vast and complex entity, filled with beauty, wonder, and terror. It's a testament to the depth and richness of existence, to the myriad possibilities that lie beyond the bounds of the tangible. It's a world I would love to explore, to seek out its secrets and face its challenges. Yet I'm also aware of the dangers it holds, the threats that lurk in its depths. It's a world that demands respect and caution, and I intend to approach it with both. Gaia, as described by the Guru, intrigued me deeply. The figure of a motherly entity, an embodiment of life itself, resonated with the tales and legends of my own world. Yet the Garu's Gaia was more expansive, a living, breathing presence in every fiber of creation, not limited to Earth alone. She was a concept that transcended the notion of a goddess, reaching into the very fabric of existence. The Garu's reverence for Gaia reminded me of the Druids and their respect for the natural world, but it ran deeper encompassing not just the physical but also the spiritual. It was a grand idea, a sense of interconnectedness that extended beyond the individual, beyond the tribe, reaching out to encompass all life in all its forms and realms. I am a creature of the physical world, bound by the tangible, the concrete. But the Guru's connection with Gaia blurred these boundaries, interweaving the material with the spiritual, the seen with the unseen. It was a radical shift from my usual perspective, but not entirely unappealing. The vastness of the Tellurian, the intricate complexities of the spirit world, was a testament to the magnitude of Gaia's existence. The notion that there were realms where the very concept of rules could change was a thought that both bewildered and fascinated me. I was reminded that reality was not always as straightforward as it seemed, and that there was always more to learn, more to explore. Gaia, like the Umbra, was a double-edged sword. Her realms held as much potential for danger as they did for enlightenment. And whether I was in the continent or in this new world of the Guru, my role as a Witcher remained the same. To face those dangers, to protect and persevere, no matter the odds. The Triad bore a striking resemblance to the natural cycles I had witnessed in my own world. It was a cosmic balancing act, creation, order, and destruction, each playing a vital role in the function of the cosmos. The wild, the force of creation, resonated with the unexpected chaos of life, the sheer unpredictability of existence. It was a constant reminder of the raw, untamed potential that I had often seen on my journeys, a wild magic that breathed life into the world. The weaver, in contrast, was the force that provided structure and order, mirroring the way societies attempted to contain and make sense of the wildness of the world. As a witcher, I was part of that structure a tool employed to maintain order amidst the chaotic forces of nature and magic. The worm, however, held a darker resonance. It reminded me of the harsh reality that nothing lasts forever, that everything, in time, would be reduced to its most basic form. It was a force of decay and destruction, yet also transformation, a reminder of the constant change that life entailed, of the inevitable end that awaited all things. Yet the idea that these forces were out of balance struck a nerve. I had seen the consequences of imbalance in my own world, the outbreaks of monsters, the havoc wreaked by uncontrolled magic. The idea of such imbalance on a cosmic scale was daunting, to say the least. 
It made the challenges I faced seem minor in comparison. In the end, I understood that the Triad, like Gaia and the Umbra, was another facet of the Garu's world that I had to consider. It was part of the complex tapestry of forces that defined their existence, and perhaps now, my own. It was a reminder that every action, every choice had its place within this grand cosmic cycle, and as a Witcher it was my duty to strive for balance, no matter the scale. Cairns, in a way, reminded me of the places of power from my world, areas of concentrated energy where the veil between worlds was thinnest, but unlike the places of power, Cairns seemed to be more refined, more controlled, existing as nexus points for the Guru Nation to harness the power of the wild and traverse into the Umbra. The concept of moon bridges fascinated me. The ability to travel great distances through a spiritual connection seemed like an invaluable asset. The gauntlet being thinnest at these locations also highlighted the dichotomy between nature and civilization that the Garu seemed to struggle with. This was an inverse to my own world, where civilization often drew more supernatural attention, whereas wilderness was a place of relative solace. The complexity of Cairns' functionality and their significance to the Guru was humbling. It was a testament to the Guru's profound connection with the spiritual world. But what struck me most was the Garu's dedication to protecting these Cairns. It was a familiar sentiment. I could understand the importance of the task the Garu had set themselves, protecting these spiritual epicenters from those who would misuse or destroy them. The rating system of Cairns was a practical approach, providing a measure of the potential risks and rewards associated with each Cairn. It allowed the Garu to prioritize their resources effectively, focusing their efforts where they were needed most. It was an interesting system, and it showed the strategic mindset the Garu applied to their guardianship. Cairns are intriguing, providing a deeper insight into the interconnectedness of the Garu's physical and spiritual worlds. As I prepared to face the challenges this new world threw at me, I could only hope to understand and respect these sacred sites as the Garu did. All in all, these concepts were a lot to digest, but they provided a valuable perspective on this new world I found myself in. They painted a picture of a world in a delicate balance, a world where the spiritual and physical were intertwined yet separate, where every action has consequences on both sides of the gauntlet. It seemed I had a lot to learn. Garu possesses an innate ferocity and savagery that, if left uncontrolled, can transform them into uncontrollable monsters. To prevent this descent into savagery, Garu society offers structure, laws, and traditions that instill a higher purpose within them. By directing their destructive impulses towards a noble objective, werewolves become formidable champions in the service of Gaia. These laws are known as the Litany. I had been living among the Garu tribe for quite some time when I heard a commotion in the distance. As I got closer, I saw that there were two factions, one larger and more dominant, and one smaller and clearly at a disadvantage. The smaller group explained that they had killed a human in self-defense but had violated one of the precepts of the litany in doing so. The larger group, on the other hand, argued that the litany was outdated and that werewolves should be free to defend themselves at all costs. I watched as the argument continued, with both sides standing firm in their beliefs. It was clear that the litany was a critical part of Guru society, but it was also clear that there were different interpretations of how to apply its precepts. Eventually the argument subsided and the two groups went their separate ways. I made my way to one of them and asked if they could explain to me more about the litany and its finer details. The litany is a central code of law that all Guru must remember and uphold. It is an epic poem and legal code that varies in traditions from tribe to tribe. While it takes great scholars to master it, most werewolves learn the 13 basic precepts. However, not all of the precepts are universally upheld as moral, and each tribe has its own views on right and wrong. Many werewolves perceive a hypocritical gap between what Garu elders preach and what they actually do, and as fewer cubs learn the details, more argue ways to bend the rules in their favor. Garu mating with Garu, it's taboo, forbidden. The law is clear, they should only mate with humans or wolves. The aim is to avoid the creation of Metis, offspring plagued by deformities, driven to the brink of insanity because of their birth. The weight of such a rule, it's heavy, the source of countless tragedies among the Guru, yet every year more Metis come into being. The world is changing, modern times are challenging old beliefs. There's a growing sentiment among the Guru, a sense that the prejudice against Metis is a relic, a vestige of the past. 
Particularly among the Homid werewolves, there's a shift. Modern notions of romance, of love, they're replacing the old tradition of marriages arranged for political maneuvering. It's a delicate balance, a tightrope walk between tradition and change. The repercussions are not just personal, they ripple through the entire Garu society, shaping and reshaping their dynamics. One can't help but wonder, will tradition hold or will change eventually take over? Only time can tell. The worm, the embodiment of evil. It's the duty of every werewolf to fight it, to stand against it. No matter where it dwells, no matter when it breeds. It's a path to respect among the Garu, proving oneself in the heat of the battle against the worm. Neglecting this duty, it's not just a personal failure, it's a step closer to the apocalypse. As the final days approach, the worm seems invincible, too powerful to be defeated. Some argue that its destruction would only be a delay, a respite before the inevitable end. The old ones, the jaded elders, they've shifted their focus to territorial control, political power and rivalries, perhaps trying to escape the grim reality of the impending apocalypse. This law, it brings with it a host of issues. What's to become of a Garu possessed by the worm? When a worm spirit is defeated, does it truly perish or does it just reform? Is it wise to target all of the worm's servants in a bid to change the course of history or should the battles be carefully chosen? And then there's the weaver. Should it be challenged? There are debates. There are questions. But time, time is running out. The correct answers need to be found and fast. It's a race against time, a race for survival. There's no room for error. The stakes, they couldn't be higher. Territory for the Guru is sacred, something to be respected. The traditional way is to request permission to enter using the howl of introduction, marking territory with scent or the slash of a claw. It's a system that's been in place for ages, and it's worked well to maintain peace among the Guru. But times are changing. The human population is increasing, and the old ways of marking and denouncing territory are becoming less practical, less effective. Some of the urban werewolves, the glasswalkers, they've adapted using technology like emails, phone calls, texting, even GPS tracking to manage their territories. Not everyone agrees, of course. There's a younger generation of Garu. They're arguing for communal management, a sharing of territories. It's a human-influenced thought, a progressive idea, but it's not easy to overcome the territorial instincts of a wolf. I've always respected the territories of others, be it man, beast, or supernatural being. It's a matter of survival, a matter of respect. I can see the value in both the old ways and the new, but the crucial part is to find a balance that respects the instincts of the Guru while adapting to the changing world. It's a challenging task, but then again, nothing worth doing is ever easy. The fourth precept, accepting an honorable surrender, is a principle that's shared by many warriors across different races and cultures, and the Guru are no different. The gesture of exposing one's throat in the face of defeat is a universal symbol of submission, a plea for mercy. The loser doesn't suffer a loss of reputation, and the victor gains praise for their mercy. It's a good rule in theory. It offers a peaceful resolution to conflicts, prevents unnecessary bloodshed. But in the heat of battle, when the blood is up and instincts take over, it's not always easy to follow. Some werewolves, even the most feral ones, struggle to uphold this law, and there are others, some warriors, who are known to accidentally overlook a surrender and attack an exposed throat. I've been in my fair share of fights. I understand the primal pull of the fight, the rush of adrenaline that can cloud your judgment. But I also understand the value of mercy, of sparing a life when it's possible. It's a hard balance to maintain, but it's an important one. The ability to accept an honorable surrender, to show mercy, is what separates a true warrior from a mindless killer. The concept of a strict hierarchical society is not foreign to me. I've seen it in many species and cultures, from dwarves to elves, and even among humans. The werewolves are no different. Honoring requests from higher-ranking members is a tenet of their society, much like the concept of renown and rank. It's a structure that brings order, a clear line of command. However, as the bonds of Garu society weaken, it's become more challenging for the younger generations to adhere to this rule. I've seen it happen among other races, too. The world is changing, and the old ways sometimes struggle to keep up. The elders may not understand or cope with the human world, and each tribe's culture influences their view on hierarchy. Loyalty can vary, sometimes only given to the elders of their own tribe, sometimes extended to high-ranking members of other tribes. 
It's a complicated issue, one that requires balance and understanding. Some tribes strictly enforce this law, while others believe in earning obedience or only respect those who prove their strength. I've learned that strength isn't always physical. It can also be the strength of character, the ability to adapt and change. A leader who can understand and navigate the changing world may earn more respect than one who clings to the old ways. It's a lesson that may be valuable to the Garu as well. Originally applied to hunting, the Kill Clause has evolved to include spoils of war. The most renowned Garu have the right to the most powerful fetishes or valuable goods found by their packmates. Silver Fangs and Shadow Lords demand their due, while other tribes accept it grudgingly. Pack mentality is strong, but modern concepts of egalitarianism or democracy can interfere. Only the strongest or most trusted Garu can repeatedly invoke this tenet for their own benefit without straining the bonds of the pack. The prohibition against eating human flesh is a sensible one, not just from a moral standpoint, but also for practical reasons. The stargazers, it seems, noticed that those werewolves who partook in such acts became susceptible to the worm's corruption. It's an interesting observation, suggesting that certain actions can make one more vulnerable to dark influences. The fact that it also led these werewolves to neglect hunting more challenging prey implies a kind of laziness or complacency, which is never a good trait in a warrior. In modern times, the law also serves a practical purpose in terms of health. Human diets are often filled with chemicals and unnatural substances that could potentially harm a werewolf's body. It's an interesting thought, and one that underlines the importance of maintaining a natural clean diet. The fact that some werewolves might still feel the urge to consume human flesh, whether in a frenzy or even when lucid, is a concerning thought. It reminds me of certain types of monsters I've hunted, who are driven by an insatiable hunger for human flesh. Such tendencies must be controlled and suppressed, for the sake of both the werewolves and the humans they might harm. The rumors about tribes like the Bone Gnawers, Silent Striders, and Red Talons having secretive camps where they ritually devour human flesh are troubling. If true, such practices could lead to further corruption and a degeneration of their warrior code. Rituals or not, cannibalism is a dangerous path to tread, one that can lead to a point of no return. This principle, which calls for the Garu to honor every creature's place in the natural world, resonates with me. I too understand the importance of respecting every creature's role in the grand scheme of things. The world is a delicate balance of forces, and disrupting that balance can have unforeseen consequences. The concept of noblesse oblige, the obligation of those with power or advantage to act generously towards those less fortunate, aligns closely with the Witcher's Code. We too are expected to use our abilities to protect those who cannot protect themselves. I respect the Garu, who adhere to this principle, and use their strength to protect and respect others. The fact that this tenet isn't always enforced with enthusiasm is disappointing, but not surprising. Many creatures, human or otherwise, often fail to live up to their ideals. The idea that the Shadow Lords and Geta Fenris determine what they believe is fairly earned respect sounds like a convenient excuse to behave as they please. The Bone Gnawer's cynicism towards this precept is understandable, given their lowly status. But it's a shame that they, who probably understand the value of respect better than any other tribe, are the ones who are most often denied it. The Lupus Werewolf's adherence to this tenet is admirable. The fact that some Garu even mourn their foe's passing shows a level of honor and respect that is rare and commendable. Such actions speak volumes about a warrior's character and are likely to earn them respect in return. This is a principle I can relate to and respect. The Garu's need for secrecy echoes the life of a Witcher. We, too, know the importance of hiding our true nature from the masses, although for different reasons. While witchers are known, the true extent of our abilities, our rituals, and the trials we undergo remain hidden, partly for our protection and partly for that of the people. The concept of the veil is intriguing. It's akin to a protective shield that cloaks the truth of the Garu's existence from humankind. This reminds me of the countless times I've had to shield the truth from people, often for their own good. Keeping such secrets is a heavy burden, but it's necessary. I fully understand the need to maintain this veil. As humans grow more advanced and the threats become more dangerous, the stakes are higher than ever. If the world knew of the Garu's existence, it could lead to panic and chaos. Fear has a way of making people act rashly, often with disastrous consequences. 
The duty of the Garu to protect humanity from the fear of their true forms is something I can empathize with. It's not just about shielding humans from physical harm. Sometimes the psychological damage can be far worse. I have seen this firsthand. The terror in people's eyes when they witness a monster. The nightmares that haunt them afterward. If the Garu can prevent that, then they are truly doing a service to humankind. In a way, this law embodies what I have always believed. That those with power have a responsibility to use it wisely and to protect those who cannot protect themselves. Whether it's a Witcher, a Garu, or any other creature, we must all strive to fulfill this duty. This law strikes a chord. As a Witcher, I'm all too familiar with the harsh reality of a life spent fighting monsters. We age, we slow down, we get injured. But in our line of work, any of these can be a death sentence. The thought of becoming a burden, of not being able to carry our own weight, is something that's haunted many a seasoned Witcher, myself included. The Guru's old way of dealing with this is brutal, but in a way, understandable. In a harsh world where survival often hangs by a thread, sometimes hard decisions must be made. But it's a relief to know that they've become more compassionate over time, giving the afflicted Garu the choice of their own ending. I respect the idea of a final journey, going out on your own terms, facing death with dignity and courage. It's a fitting end for a warrior. There's something poignant about the notion of disappearing into the wilderness one last time, leaving only legends behind. I find the children of Gaia tribe's stance admirable. Choosing to stand by those who are struggling, to support them in their darkest hours, requires a depth of compassion that is often overlooked in a warrior society. It's a testament to their strength and their character. The choice of some elder Garu to return to their former lives, to seek peace in their final days, is a path that I can understand. In the face of death, the familiar can be a great comfort. There's a certain poetry to it, a sense of coming full circle. In the end, each of us must face our own mortality. The manner of that confrontation is deeply personal and should be respected. Whether through a final battle, a quiet departure, or a return to the past, each guru should have the right to choose their own ending. This law brings to mind the politics of Witcher schools. We don't have alphas per se, but each school does have its leader, and they don't hold their position by chance. They're the strongest, the smartest, the most cunning. There's an unspoken understanding that if you want to lead, you have to prove yourself worthy. The concept of challenging a weak alpha is something I can understand. Leadership isn't a privilege, it's a responsibility. If a leader can't perform their duty, if they can't make the hard decisions or keep their pack safe, then they have no business leading. It's a brutal truth, but in our line of work, weak leadership can be as dangerous as any monster. I respect the ritualistic nature of these challenges among the Garu. It's not just a brawl, it's a formal process. That speaks to a level of discipline and respect that I appreciate. I don't approve of leaders who manipulate the system to avoid being challenged, though. Declaring constant war or exploiting a challenger's weakness seems more like an act of desperation than true leadership. It undermines the spirit of the law and shows a lack of respect for their pack. The idea of a pack systematically challenging a stubborn leader is an interesting one. It's a risky strategy, but it shows a unity and determination that could serve them well. A leader who can't recognize the dissatisfaction of their pack is already failing in their duty. In the end, this law seems to be about accountability. An alpha is accountable to their pack, and the pack has the right to hold them to that. That's a principle I can stand behind. This echoes the code that witchers live by during contracts. Clear communication and obedience can mean the difference between life and death. In a monster hunt, one wrong move can be fatal, and that's not much different from a battle among the Garu, I reckon. I can see why the Alpha's word would be law during a fight. A clear chain of command prevents chaos and ensures that everyone works together effectively. Anyone who's been in a fight knows that hesitation can be deadly. If everyone's second-guessing the orders or arguing about strategy, that's when things go wrong. As for leaders who abuse this law by declaring constant war, it's a clear misuse of power. It's a betrayal of their pack's trust, and it can only lead to more problems down the line. But I can understand the difficulty in challenging such a leader, especially during a time of crisis. The court-martial system presided over by a philodox seems fair, given their role as mediators and judges. It's essential that a werewolf who disobeys has the chance to explain their actions. There are always exceptions and extenuating circumstances. The corruption of the worm, magical control, or a highly incompetent alpha can all lead a Garu to act out of line. 
The balance of renown gained for valor and lost for insubordination is interesting. It's a tangible reminder of the consequences of their actions, but it also means that Agaru could potentially redeem themselves in the eyes of their pack. This law highlights the importance of trust and respect between an Alpha and their pack. The Alpha must be someone the pack can rely on in battle, someone who makes decisions for the good of all, not just for themselves. And in turn, the pack must trust their Alpha and follow their orders, even when the odds are against them. It's a complex dynamic, but it's one that can lead to a formidable fighting force. The importance of Cairns isn't lost on me. Any site that holds that much mystical energy is bound to be a prime target for enemies. It makes sense that leading anyone to such a site, intentionally or not, would result in severe punishment. These places aren't just important to the Garu. They are vital to the health of the Earth itself. The range of punishments for breaking the litany is quite vast. It's clear that they take their laws seriously. The loss of renown must be a blow, but it's nothing compared to being declared a rogue. Being ostracized from your pack, from your entire society, is a heavy punishment indeed. The method of trial depending on the tribe is an interesting concept. I suppose it's similar to how different kingdoms have different laws and ways of enforcing them. Trial by combat, arguments, jury trials, spirit summoning, or modern criminology. They all have their place, depending on the situation and the culture of the tribe. As for those that form packs of Ronin, rejecting the litany completely, I can see the appeal, especially as the apocalypse draws near. When it feels like the world is ending, rules can seem less important. But in my experience, it's in those times that rules matter the most. Without them, chaos ensues. And in a time of crisis, that's the last thing anyone needs. All in all, the laws of the Garu are strict, but they're necessary. They're what keeps the Garu society together, what keeps them strong in the face of their enemies. And with the apocalypse looming, they'll need all the strength they can muster. During my time with these werewolves, I've observed their society's strong hierarchy, which plays a crucial role in maintaining order and focusing their rage. It's fascinating to see how each werewolf finds their place within this structure. At the bottom, there are the cubs, young and curious, always eager to learn. They remind me of children, full of questions and wonder about the world around them. As they grow and prove themselves, they transition into Clyath. These young Garu take on various tasks for their sept, traveling far and wide to learn more about their society and their place within it. As they gain esteem and experience, they rise to become Fostern. These Garu act as emissaries between septs, sometimes embarking on journeys to distant cairns to broaden their understanding and connections. They carry a certain air of responsibility and wisdom that sets them apart from their younger counterparts. Adrian werewolves are a step above Fostern. They hold lesser political positions within their sept and are more deliberate in their travels, developing political rivalries and alliances as they move between cairns. Their influence grows as they navigate the complex web of Garu politics. Athro werewolves are called upon for the most dangerous and thrilling adventures their tribes have to offer. These seasoned warriors and cunning strategists might find themselves traveling the world for critical missions or summoned by distant tribes to aid in their most dire moments. At the top of this hierarchy stand the elders, commanding great respect from all ranks. Whether they hold an esteemed position or not, their experience and wisdom are held in the highest regard. These are the werewolves who have seen it all, and their guidance is invaluable to those who follow in their footsteps. The intricate dance between these ranks creates a fascinating social structure. As the werewolves interact, their hierarchy guides their relationships and behavior, providing a sense of order and stability within their society. It's amazing to witness how different it is from anything I've encountered in my own world. The concept of the pack as the foundation of Garu society makes perfect sense. It mirrors the natural behavior of wolves in the wild and serves to strengthen the bonds and unity among werewolves. Having a diverse group of members from different tribes and auspices allows for a broader range of skills and abilities, which undoubtedly helps the pack to face a wide variety of challenges. The shared purpose of a pack is an important aspect of their structure. With a common goal, the members can work together effectively, utilizing their individual strengths to achieve their objectives. Whether their focus lies in sabotage, exploring the spirit world, or engaging in political intrigue, each pack has its unique approach to solving problems and fulfilling their duties as protectors of Gaia. Elders who are able to recognize the specialties of each pack can effectively delegate tasks and responsibilities, 
ensuring that the most suited pack is assigned to a particular challenge. This level of organization and cooperation is key to the Garu's success in their ongoing battle against the worm and the other threats they face. In the end, the pack structure serves as a microcosm of Garu society as a whole. The cooperation, shared purpose, and unity found within a pack are essential elements for the survival and success of the werewolves in their fight to protect the Earth and maintain balance. The tradition of pledging fealty to a totem spirit appears to be an essential aspect of Garu pack life. It's a powerful symbol of the pack's unity and purpose, and provides them with tangible benefits in terms of guidance and mystical power. The totem is not just a spiritual guide, but also a marker of the pack's identity, reflecting their aims and strengths. The fact that packs sometimes form specifically to serve a particular totem shows the significant influence these spirits have on Garu society. It also highlights the mutual respect and symbiotic relationship between the Garu and the spirit world. The Garu understand that they are part of a greater whole, and that their actions have repercussions in the spirit world, just as the actions of the spirits affect the physical world. However, the diminishing magic in the world and the ensuing difficulties in summoning totem spirits is concerning. It's a clear sign of the imbalance and the encroaching threats the Garu must face. Pax having to embark on quests to find their totem spirit is a significant change, and one that potentially leaves them vulnerable without their spiritual guidance. Pax come and go, much like the individuals within them, but their impacts, through their deeds and the spirits they serve, leave lasting marks on Garu society. The process of transitioning from a cub to a Clioth, marked by the rite of passage, is a significant milestone in a Garu's life. It symbolizes their acceptance into one of the 13 tribes of the Garu nation and the beginning of their learning journey. This event has great significance as it provides each Garu with the opportunity to fully immerse themselves in their tribe's unique culture, learning its gifts and hidden knowledge. The fact that each tribe originates from different regions, each with its distinct tribal homelands and kinfolk, creates a rich tapestry of cultural diversity within the Garu nation. This diversity seems to bring strength, allowing the Garu to draw from a broad range of experiences and strategies in their fight against the worm. The Garu tribes each have their own unique gifts that are taught to them by spirits, and some tribes like the Glasswalkers regularly reinvent their relationship with the spirits. Learning a gift from another tribe requires the Garu to be on good terms with at least one member of the tribe who can summon the appropriate spirit, and the Garu must convince the spirit she is worthy of its blessings. Some Garu are against outsiders learning their tribal blessings, while others believe it strengthens the Garu nation in their war against the worm. The historical agreement of the Concord, which brought together the then 16 major tribes, appears to have been a pivotal moment in Garu history. The unity of these tribes, despite their distinct backgrounds, shows the Garu's capability for cooperation and mutual support. However, the loss of three tribes since the Concord is a poignant reminder of the dangers and challenges the Garu face. The notion of one tribe potentially reconsidering its place within the Concordiat would have unknown ramifications. It suggests a level of internal dissent or dissatisfaction within the Garu nation, which could lead to significant changes in their societal structure. It would be interesting to observe how such a development might unfold and the potential impact it could have on the overall Garu nation. While I have yet to meet each tribe in person, I have enough information at hand to give a general overview of each one. The Black Furies appear to embody a deep-rooted strength and dedication to justice, particularly in relation to the exploitation and mistreatment of women. Their origins in the ancient cultures of Greece and Asia Minor, along with their close ties to Luna as Artemis, bring a sense of timeless commitment to their cause. This historical context adds depth to their values and principles, making their mission feel even more significant. It's noteworthy that they don't unite around misandry, but instead an ideal of gender equality. This suggests a nuanced approach to their cause, one that doesn't involve simplistic us-against-them thinking, but rather aims to rectify imbalances and injustices. Their willingness to recruit disaffected female Garu from other tribes indicates their commitment to empowering those who may feel marginalized or unheard. The acceptance of male Metis, thanks to their totem Pegasus, further shows their openness to diversity within their ranks. Their involvement in modern struggles such as combating slavery, sex trafficking, and abuse is admirable. It reflects the contemporary relevance of their tribe and their willingness to engage with the world's darkest issues head-on. The Furies' fierce protection of their sacred territories, 
demonstrates their tenacity and resolve. The gifts of the Black Furies offer them an extensive array of powers and abilities, ranging from healing to shape-shifting. Their capabilities are as diverse as they are potent. Some allow them to heal wounds rapidly, a crucial advantage in the relentless battles they face. Their aptitude for disguise and deception grant them the power to alter their gender or assume various forms, respectively. More offensive abilities allow them to inflict intense pain or immobilize their enemies. Other gifts allow for animal communication, inducing fear, and even petrifying opponents. In essence, the Black Fury's gifts equip them with a remarkable set of tools for both war and survival. Their tribal totem, Pegasus, along with Panther, the Muses, and Medusae, represent a collection of powerful, inspiring figures from myth and legend. These totems likely provide the tribe with spiritual guidance and strength, reinforcing their resolve in the face of adversity. The Bone Nars, despite their seemingly unappealing reputation, seem to embody the very essence of resilience and adaptability. In their rags-to-riches origins, they represent the triumph of the underdog, demonstrating that even in the most unfavorable conditions, survival is possible perhaps even inevitable. Living in territories that others disregard, they have adapted to a way of life that many would find difficult, if not impossible. They've turned the perceived disadvantages of these areas into their strengths, reinforcing their reputation as hardy survivors. Their democratic septs and haphazard traditions may seem chaotic to outsiders, but I imagine there's a form of organized disorder that works for them. Their willingness to form alliances with other supernatural beings indicates a pragmatic and open-minded approach, which can be highly advantageous in a complex world. The Bone Gnawers still maintain a sense of honor, wisdom, and glory, a testament to their strong internal values. Their emphasis on hospitality, generosity, and family reinforces this, showing that despite their rough exterior, they possess deep-seated virtues. Their kinfolk, selected from the tough and resilient members of society, reflect the tribe's core strengths. The rarity of lupus kin may be due to their urban habitats and human-centric lifestyles. The spirits they form pacts with, rat, raccoon spirits, lost dogs, and spirits of junk and rust, likely embody their ability to find value and strength in what others may overlook or discard. Their gifts are notably attuned to survival in harsh urban environments, reflecting their knack for thriving in the underbelly of human society. From what I gather, their abilities range from the mundane to the astounding. At a basic level, they can conjure edible food from nearly anything, a handy trick given their circumstances. Their resilience is remarkable too, with gifts that help them shrug off poisons and toxins that would fell a normal man. But what really catches my attention is their capacity for disguise. Changing one's form is no small feat, yet these bone gnawers can transform into large dogs, allowing them to navigate cityscapes unnoticed. As for summoning a swarm of vermin to overrun a building, well, that's a level of control over nature that would give even a druid pause. In their own way, the bone gnawers are a testament to adaptability and survival, traits any witcher can appreciate. The children of Gaia present a unique perspective on the nature of strength and conflict. They embody the concept that true strength does not always lie in aggression, but rather in the ability to foster unity, mediate disputes, and advocate for peace. This approach may seem contradictory to the common perception of the Garu as warriors, but in fact, it reveals a deeper understanding of what it means to fight for Gaia. Their origins, born from an act of peace during the Impergium, sets the tone for their tribe's philosophy. Their focus on negotiation and diplomacy rather than confrontation exemplifies a more strategic approach to preserving the Garu nation and combating the worm. This is not to say they shy away from battle. They are as capable as any other tribe when the need arises. The children of Gaia's involvement in human politics is an interesting strategy. It seems they aim to address the root causes of the issues that plague both the human and Garu societies, promoting compassion, peace, and tolerance. Their crisis of faith as the apocalypse approaches is understandable. Their commitment to peace and unity is being tested to its limits, and the rising tide of Hirano, a psychological disease that plagues the Garu and doubts about the Veil's secrecy reflects this struggle. The gifts granted to them reflect their values. They can make themselves overlooked, disable weapons, and even use natural armaments without killing, a trait unique to their approach to conflict. Their healing capabilities, both for themselves and others, are particularly noteworthy. They also possess a calming influence, useful in avoiding unnecessary strife. 
and an ability to evade pursuers that rivals a witcher's agility. Their balance between peace and readiness for war is uniquely compelling, and something I can understand. Their tribal totem, Unicorn, perfectly symbolizes their beliefs. A creature of peace, purity, and gentleness, the Unicorn can also be ferocious in war, much like the tribe itself. The preference for totems like Dove and Narwhal, along with spirits of Glade and Starlight, further reflects their commitment to peace and harmony. I find the Fianna to be an interesting tribe. Their historical ties to Celtic culture are fascinating, and their strong emotions and social nature seem to give them a vibrant and lively atmosphere. I can't deny that their love for life is an admirable trait, even if it can lead to heated situations. The Fianna's relationship with their Matisse is a troubling aspect. It's a harsh stance to take, blaming their physical deformities on a deformed spirit. I've seen enough in my life to know that physical appearance often has nothing to do with the spirit within. Their supposed connection to the Fae also raises an eyebrow. I've had my fair share of encounters with such beings, and they're rarely as simple or as benign as they seem. If the Fianna do indeed share a lineage with them, it could explain their affinity for art and their vibrant nature. Their dedication to preserving Garu culture is commendable. In a world that's changing so rapidly, maintaining a link to the past is important. I can respect that, even if their methods and beliefs are different from mine. Their tribal totem, Stag, seems fitting for a tribe so full of life and passion. The presence of other animal spirits like Rabbit and Impala, as well as Naturae like Brook and Dawn, further emphasize their connection to nature. The Fianna hold a unique set of abilities or gifts, bestowed by spirits. They range from invoking fairies to altering their own physical size, a wide range indeed. The Fianna are renowned for their vibrant spirit and deep connections to the Fae, and these gifts seem to mirror those characteristics. Each gift comes with its own distinct rules of usage and is imparted by a particular kind of spirit, from a humble rabbit spirit to a more unsettling pain spirit. I respect the diversity of their abilities. Their connection to both the natural and supernatural worlds is something I can relate to. They have their own ways of surviving and thriving in a world that's often hostile, not unlike witchers. All in all, the Fianna are a tribe of extremes. Their vibrant, passionate nature can be both a strength and a weakness. But in the end, it's their commitment to their culture, their kin, and their passion for life that truly defines them. I have a certain level of respect for the Geta Fenris, given their warrior nature and commitment to valor and strength. Their dedication to their cause is unquestionable, and their willingness to die gloriously for Gaia is admirable, in a way. It's a mindset I can somewhat relate to, considering my own line of work. However, their elitist attitudes and deep-rooted prejudices against weakness can be problematic. Strength isn't everything, and wisdom and cunning should not be seen as mere compliments to might. The best warriors are those who can balance all these qualities, in my opinion. Their rite of passage sounds brutal, which is expected given their warlike nature. While I understand the need to test one's strength and determination, there's a fine line between a difficult trial and a suicidal one. The Fenrir's belief in an afterlife mirroring Valhalla is an interesting aspect of their culture. It's a powerful motivator, promising eternal glory to those who die bravely in battle. However, it also fosters a kind of fatalism that can lead to unnecessary loss of life. Their tribal totem, Fenris, fits their warrior ethos perfectly. Aegir, Harafin, the Norns, and Surtur all spirits allied to the Get reflect a balance between warlike and wise aspects, which is somewhat ironic considering the tribe's focus on strength and valor. The Get of Fenris, as renowned warriors among the Garu, carry an array of potent and fearsome abilities that echo the might of their tribal totem, Fenris. Their martial prowess is amplified by their gifts, enabling them to seamlessly shift between attack and defense with the swiftness of a lightning bolt. Their lethal claws, sharp as razors, can inflict devastating wounds on their enemies. The Fenrir exhibit a remarkable tolerance to pain, allowing them to fight through injuries that would fell lesser beings. They can even manifest their tribal totem's terrifying visage, growing larger and more formidable, commanding respect from allies and instilling dread in foes. Their gifts extend beyond mere physical enhancements. They can command the elemental power of fire, transforming their blood into a venomous substance or turning their teeth and claws into frigid ice daggers. They can slow fleeing enemies, emit terrifying snarls that weaken their foes, and even harden their skin akin to the resilient hide of an earth troll. They can channel the very strength of Thor, doubling their might 
and even share their pain with those who inflicted it upon them. Some can tap into Gaia's energy, releasing a powerful howl that varies in effect, or showcasing unbeatable endurance. The most powerful among them can summon the great wolves of Valhalla to their side in battle, or invoke the war avatar of Great Fenris himself, the ultimate testament to their tribe's deep and sacred bond with their totem. Overall, the Ged of Fenris are a formidable tribe, but their single-minded focus on strength and valor, coupled with their prejudices, can lead to a destructive and self-defeating cycle. Their commitment to their cause is praiseworthy, but I believe they would benefit from a more balanced approach. The Glass Walkers are a fascinating tribe. Their adaptation to modern times, blending technology and shamanism, is a refreshing departure from the more traditional ways of other tribes. The city ecology they defend might be wounded or diseased, but the idea of healing it is a noble one. Their adaptation, however, seems to come at a cost. With their focus on humanity and technology, they seem to be losing touch with their wolf bloodlines. This could become a significant issue in the future. Also, the fact that their tribal tenets are so confusing to some of their lupus members that they seek refuge with other tribes is concerning. Having more enemies than most tribes is another risk they have to manage, especially considering their urban territories. Vampires are not to be trifled with, and I've learned that firsthand. The fact that they've gained more information on Pentex, a human worm corporation that controls a large portion of humanity's consumer goods and its activities than any other tribe is impressive. That knowledge can be a powerful weapon against the worm. Their set of gifts is a fascinating blend of natural instincts and technological prowess. They can manipulate simple machines, perform diagnostics, and even enhance their senses through cybernetics, a distinct departure from the natural abilities I'm used to. They also have the capacity to amplify the power of firearms, create blackouts, and wield electroshock against their enemies. These abilities clearly reflect their affinity for the urban, machine-filled world. The most potent gifts even allow them to reconcile their dual nature as embodiments of both the wild and the woven, as well as summon net spiders, giving them an extraordinary level of control over digital systems. This fusion of the primal and the technological is unusual and captivating. It's a reminder that even in a world filled with supernatural beings and mystical forces, technology still holds a significant place. These glass walkers with their peculiar gifts would certainly be formidable allies or foes. Their tribal totem, cockroach, is fitting. Much like the creature itself, the glass walkers have shown an incredible ability to adapt and survive. The other entities they honor, such as gremlins, scab birds, and the financial mulacrante, or money spiders, reflect their unique blend of technology and shamanism. The glass walker's adaptation to the modern world is impressive, but it's not without its potential pitfalls. It's a delicate balance, and one that they'll need to manage carefully. The Red Talons are a tribe that seems to exist in constant conflict. Their deep resentment towards humanity and refusal to fully embrace their dual nature creates tension not just with the other tribes, but within themselves as well. The notion of advocating for human extinction is a drastic, dire proposition. It's a dangerous path to tread, to consider one species superior to another, and it mirrors the prejudices that non-humans, including witchers, face in my world. Their wolf-centric lifestyle and desire to maintain the balance between the human and wolf aspects of the Guru is commendable, however. As a witcher, I understand the struggle of straddling two worlds, never truly belonging to either. The Red Talon's adherence to the principle of survival of the fittest also resonates. It's a harsh reality that is all too familiar. But the rumors of brutal rites performed on human captives are disturbing. Cruelty for cruelty's sake is never justified. It's a sign of slipping towards the very darkness they're fighting against. Even in war, there are lines that should not be crossed. Physically, they seem to embody the image of the traditional werewolf. Large, intimidating, with sharp claws and a predatory gaze. Their territories, far from human settlements and marked with warnings like bones of trespassers, are a stark reflection of their fierce nature and disdain for human encroachment. The Red Talons are bestowed with extraordinary abilities that reflect their primal nature and intense disdain for humanity. Taught by Griffin, their tribal totem, these gifts enable them to communicate with their kin in the wild, discern the strength and weakness within a pack, and cloak their predatory traces. An extension of their senses aids them in tracking prey, while their presence alone can inspire a profound dread in humans, reminding them of the wilderness's inherent power and demanding respect. 
Manipulating the classic elements of earth, air, fire, and water, the Red Talons can exert dominance over their surroundings. They can reduce their targets to a state of wild frenzy, emit an aura of primal terror, and have the power to disintegrate man-made substances. They can extend their senses across vast distances to monitor their territories and create illusions of an insurmountable wilderness to confound intruders. Their howls carry the fury of their rage, capable of causing severe harm. Adept in altering the terrain to hinder foes, they can even force transformation upon others, or call upon Gaia herself to unleash the wrath of the natural world. To further solidify their stand against the artificial, they can induce severe allergic reactions to man-made materials in their targets, and can selectively develop immunity against various forms of technology, marking them as the truly wild spirits of the Garu Nation. Their tribal totem, Griffin, a symbol of animalistic anger and hunting skill, is fitting. Griffins are fierce predators, and I've encountered my fair share, but they're also creatures of balance, living between the earth and the sky. Perhaps the Red Talons could learn something from that. Balance, after all, is the key to survival. While the Red Talons' resentment toward humanity is understandable given their perspective, their extreme measures and potential for brutality are concerning. They serve as a reminder that balance, not dominance, is essential for the health of the world. The Shadow Lords are a tribe that commands respect, if not likability. Their methods might be seen as ruthless and cold, but their effectiveness is undeniable. Their focus on meritocracy is admirable, even if it leads to power struggles within the tribe. In a way, it reminds me of the Witcher's Path, where strength and skill are key for survival, and the trials we undergo to become Witchers are brutal. However, their manipulative tactics and power games can be concerning. The art of politics is a dangerous game and can lead to division and distrust. Using fear as a tool to unite the Garu Nation, while practical, is a precarious strategy. Fear can lead to desperation and chaos if not carefully managed. Their tribal totem, Grandfather Thunder, is a reflection of their values, power, hierarchy, and dominance. The fact that they've managed to dominate spirits that others would find difficult to control, like spirits of night and pain, is a testament to their strength and cunning. But again, it's a delicate balance. Power untempered by wisdom and compassion can easily lead to tyranny. In appearance, their Saturnine features and dark coats in lupus form seem to mirror their intense and somewhat dark nature. Their preference for cairns in starkly beautiful settings like wildlands from a gothic romance in a way symbolizes their stern and harsh outlook on life. Their gifts encompass a broad range of abilities. Some allow them to subtly manipulate perceptions, instilling intimidation or masking their intentions. Others enable them to detect and exploit an opponent's weaknesses providing a significant edge in combat. Certain abilities let them control spiritual entities or manipulate their surroundings, offering versatility in various situations. There are even gifts that force obedience or create shadow duplicates of the lords themselves to augment their ranks. These unique and powerful gifts require deep understanding for effective use or counteraction. They underline the Shadow Lord's reputation for being both subtle and powerful. I see the Shadow Lords as a powerful and ambitious tribe. They're not afraid to play the political game and do what's necessary to achieve their goals. However, their ruthless methods and constant internal power struggles can be their downfall if not kept in check. The Silent Striders, at first glance, share a kinship with Witchers. Both are wanderers, often seen as outsiders by others, serving crucial roles in their respective societies yet rarely fully accepted. The Strider's curse that haunts them with spirits of the dead and severs their connection to their ancestors seems tragic, and yet they carry their burden with a sense of purpose and duty. Their restlessness, their inability to stay in one place for long, is something I can relate to. Always on the move, from one contract to the next, it's a lifestyle that can be both liberating and isolating. It's a tough road to walk and can lead to solitude, but it also affords a unique perspective on the world. Their deep-seated vengeance against vampires is understandable given their history. I've fought my share of vampires and know they can be dangerous adversaries. Still, as with all creatures, not all are inherently evil, and it's important not to let revenge consume you. The Silent Strider's loyalty to friends and value for true companions is admirable. In a world where alliances can shift like the wind, such steadfastness is rare and valuable. Their approach to relationships, brief and intense, speaks to the transient nature of their existence. In terms of appearance, 
the lean and fit forms of the silent striders, reminiscent of jackals or Anubis, the Egyptian deity, are indicative of their origins and constant travels. Their kinfolk, often dispossessed drifters themselves, reflect the striders' nomadic lifestyle. The silent striders, guided by spirits of journey and swiftness, are blessed with exceptional capabilities. These gifts, passed down by diverse spirit guides, equip them with an uncanny sense of direction and a heightened perception of the supernatural. Whether under the canopy of stars or lost in the wilderness, the silent striders can navigate with unerring precision. Their steps make no sound, and their pace is a blur to the naked eye, allowing them to cover vast distances with astonishing speed. Their gifts also permit them a unique interaction with the spectral realm. Their vision encompasses the spectral landscape, enabling them to perceive restless spirits and haunted areas, and they possess an innate ability to sense the corruption of the worm. Furthermore, they can navigate spiritual pathways effortlessly, cloak themselves from the attention of others, and communicate in any language. Their adaptability extends beyond mere communication, enabling them to traverse liquid surfaces, resist diseases, and adapt to extreme environmental conditions. With a leap, they can cross immense distances, and their marks can attract the attention of the dead. Their prowess extends to the ability to neutralize blood magic and to move at speeds that defy comprehension. Lastly, they have mastered the art of stepping into and out of the spiritual realm at will, and their command over lunar energies allows them to create bridges of moonlight for instantaneous travel. These gifts make the silent striders the unrivaled wanderers of the physical and spiritual realms. Their tribal totem, Owl, the wise hunter who flies silently by night, seems fitting. Owls are creatures of stealth and wisdom, traits that the silent striders seem to embody. The peculiar spirits of Owl's brood, the Darklings and the Twiceborn, add a touch of mystery to the tribe. The silent striders are a tribe I feel a certain kinship with. Their journey is a solitary one, marked by loss and vengeance, but also by duty and loyalty. They serve as a reminder of the importance of persistence, even in the face of adversity. The Silver Fangs are a tribe that carries a heavy burden of responsibility, and they do so with a sense of nobility and tradition. Their claim to leadership of the Guru Nation, tracing their lineage back to the progenitor wolf, speaks to their pride and sense of destiny. However, their focus on maintaining a pure bloodline, leading to inbreeding and weaker or unstable leaders, is a testament to the dangers of pride and tradition when carried to an extreme. Their interpretation of leadership varies from noblesse oblige to outright tyranny, demonstrating the complexities within the tribe. Their ability to rally other tribes in times of war speaks to their charisma and influence. However, it's clear there is a tension between tradition and the necessity for change, which could have significant implications for the future of the tribe and the Guru nation. In terms of appearance, their aristocratic lineage is reflected in their physical forms, both human and wolf. Their fondness for jewelry and ornate equipment further highlights their status and heritage. Their careful management of their kinfolk, both human and wolf, demonstrates their commitment to preserving their lineage and their ties to their noble past. The Silver Fangs wield a collection of gifts that befit their regal status. These abilities enhance their physical prowess and sensory perception, allowing them to transform their bodies into lethal weapons or set their tools ablaze. Other defensive capabilities provide protective barriers of light or formidable spiritual armors, making them formidable in combat. Moreover, Silver Fangs can exercise control over the will of other Guru and suppress opponents' supernatural powers, reducing formidable foes to mere mortals. Their high-level abilities include evading fatal attacks, transforming their bodies into resistant and deadly forms, and even eradicating the undead, restoring the natural order. Thus, the Silver Fangs combine leadership, combat prowess, and mystical abilities, marking them as a truly distinct and powerful tribe. Their tribal totem, Falcon, who inspires from high above, seems fitting for a tribe that considers itself first among equals. Their dedication to avian or solar spirits reflects their noble and lofty aspirations. The Silver Fangs strike me as a tribe struggling to balance tradition and necessity. Their nobility and sense of destiny are admirable, but their adherence to maintaining a pure bloodline, even to the point of their own detriment, is concerning. Like many noble families I've encountered, they are both inspiring and cautionary. Their struggle to evolve without losing their identity is a challenge that many, including witchers, can understand. Their future, much like the Guru nation they lead, seems uncertain but crucial.
The stargazers are a tribe that seems to understand the value of balance and introspection, traits that resonate with me. They focus on mastering their inner selves and their rage, seeking enlightenment through meditation, philosophy, and lucid dreaming. Their approach reminds me of the Witcher's Path, a journey of self-mastery and balance between our human side and the mutations that make us Witchers. Their roots in India and the Himalayas and their spread throughout Asia suggest a diverse background and a rich history of thought and philosophy. Their focus on wisdom and leadership and their use of riddles and patience tests for rank are fascinating. This approach feels like a refreshing alternative to the often brute force or political maneuvering in other tribes. The stargazers are not pacifists, despite what some might think due to their focus on balance and inner peace. They've developed a martial art called Kalindo, reminiscent of the way witchers are trained in various forms of combat. The ability to shift forms more quickly than other Guru suggests a level of skill and discipline that is impressive. The challenges they face in the end times, maintaining their numbers and ideals while fighting against the worm, are daunting. But their dedication and determination, even in the face of these hardships, are commendable. Stargazers have the unique ability to manipulate the essence of the elements, altering their fundamental nature while retaining their form. This tribe can penetrate obscurities, whether they be physical barriers such as darkness and fog, or more abstract ones like illusions. They're capable of engaging in combat without causing lasting harm, subduing their foes through a gentle yet firm touch. With heightened senses, stargazers can anticipate their opponent's actions, gaining a strategic advantage in combat situations. They have a unique relationship with the wind, which allows them to disarm their adversaries and turn their weapons against them. When faced with overwhelming odds, they can redirect their enemy's attacks, creating chaos within the ranks of their foes. At a more advanced level, stargazers can blend the physical attributes of their human and werewolf forms, gaining the benefits of both while maintaining their human appearance. Perhaps their most profound ability is their connection to the cosmos, allowing them to glean insights and wisdom directly from the universe itself, answering questions and solving problems that others might find insurmountable. This combination of physical prowess and spiritual insight makes the stargazers formidable opponents and wise counselors. In appearance, their lighter builds and the various shades of their coats speak to their diversity and adaptability. Their approach to maintaining balance by encouraging wolf mates over human kin is interesting and further emphasizes their commitment to their philosophy. Their tribal totem, Chimera, is an apt symbol for their multifaceted approach to life and their pursuit of wisdom. The stargazers are a tribe that seems to have learned the value of introspection, wisdom, and balance, traits that resonate strongly with me. They embody a philosophy and way of life that seems both profound and necessary in a world threatened by the worm. The Uktena tribe is a curious one. Their focus on gathering and preserving mystical lore is something I can relate to, as knowledge and understanding of the supernatural have always been central to the life of a witcher. Their adaptability, as shown by their interactions with humans from various cultures, is an admirable trait, although it's clear that their history with the Europeans has left a mark. Their bitterness and caution, while understandable given their past, could potentially lead to trouble. Old vendettas and grudges often lead to more harm than good. Nevertheless, the Uktena have shown a commitment to the Gaian cause, and their cooperation with other tribes, even if only when necessary, speaks to their ability to put the larger picture before personal feelings. The Uktena's mastery of occult mysteries and their dealings with darker entities put them in a precarious position. Their knowledge and understanding of the worm, while a powerful tool, also presents a significant risk. The prospect of an Uktena falling to the worm is a frightening one indeed, yet their continued fight against the worm, despite the dangers, is a testament to their resolve. The Uktena tribe stands as the guardians of the hidden and the forgotten, their gifts reflecting their profound connection to mystic energies and the natural world. They can sense magic, discerning its origins and power, and even the most insidious emanations of the worm aren't safe from their notice. Through their communion with nature, they can harness the abilities of various animals, scaling sheer surfaces like a gecko or soaring through the sky like a bird. They can move through water with ease, resembling a swift fish more than a guru. Their mystical prowess allows them to manipulate darkness, summon and control ethereal tentacles, and even reach into the spirit realm to converse with the entities residing there. 
Furthermore, their mastery over the ancient principles of sympathetic magic grants the Octina the ability to use their specially crafted fetish dolls to inflict harm from a distance. They can banish totems, severing the spiritual rapport between packmates and ensnare spirits with chains of mist, sapping their strength. Their control over the elements is awe-inspiring, capable of summoning elementals from the earth, air, fire, or water. With a mere gesture, they can move objects of significant weight, drawing upon the land's energies. Finally, they possess the rare gift of scrying, viewing distant events in reflective surfaces, and can even become invisible, vanishing from sight entirely. Their array of gifts make them not only formidable in combat, but also critical in the preservation of Gaia's mysteries and the fight against the worm. In appearance, the reddish-black fur of the Uktana's pure breed members and their penchant for occult trinkets from diverse traditions suggest a tribe that values its heritage and the mystic. The fact that their kinfolk and territories are among oppressed ethnic groups shows their connection to the dispossessed and the marginalized. Their tribal totem, the Uktena, reflects their association with water and snake spirits. This affiliation with such ancient and primal elements seems to further underline their deep-rooted connection to the mystical and the spiritual. All in all, the Uktena strike me as a tribe with a rich heritage and profound understanding of the supernatural, who must constantly walk the line between harnessing their knowledge for good and being consumed by it. The Wendigo tribe's strong focus on purity and tradition, while making them somewhat rigid and insular, also grants them a deep connection with their ancestral roots and spiritual practices. This bond to their heritage is both a strength and a weakness. It can provide them with a sense of purpose and unity, but it can also lead to intolerance and exclusion, particularly towards Mitis. Their swift, remorseless, and deadly hunting style is a reflection of their survivalist mentality and their harsh environment. It also aligns with their dedication to purity, as there is little room for hesitation or mercy in the wild. This same principle guides their leadership, valuing strength and adherence to their tribal ideals. Interactions with other tribes are often strained, and this isolation, while protecting their cultural purity, could potentially leave them at a disadvantage when larger alliances are needed. Nevertheless, they maintain strong alliances with the Talons and Uktina, likely because these tribes share a similar history of suffering and marginalization. The Wendigo's commitment to protecting their territories and assessing the progress of the war against the worm speaks to their sense of responsibility and vigilance. This defensive stance, however, may limit their ability to take the offensive when necessary. Their appearance, resembling strong timber wolves with coats of various shades of gray, aligns with their connection to the wild and their harsh environment. Their kinfolk being exclusively Native American peoples, particularly those in tribal communities away from large cities, further underscores their commitment to purity and tradition. The Wendigo tribe of werewolves possess an array of gifts that truly encapsulate their connection with the harsh wilderness, particularly the relentless power of winter and their hunting prowess. They are capable of blending seamlessly into their surroundings making them virtually untraceable in the wild, while their profound kinship with the wind allows them to control and manipulate it to their advantage, either to summon chilling breezes or to direct gusts powerful enough to knock enemies off their feet. This mastery extends to the point of being able to invoke wind spirits for guidance and to create perfect mirror images of themselves that can confuse and distract their adversaries. Yet, their abilities are not just limited to manipulation of the natural elements. They can become relentless hunters, drawn irresistibly towards the heartbeat of their prey, and even gain strength from an enemy's flesh and blood, a testament to their association with Great Wendigo, the hungry cannibal spirit. Their communion with the harsh winter enables them to resist cold, and they can even infuse their bodies with the essence of freezing cold, making them impervious to its effects. In dire circumstances, they can summon avatars of Great Wendigo to hunt down specific targets, or call upon the curse of the Wendigo to cause their enemies' innards to turn to ice. The Wendigo's spiritual capabilities are further showcased in their ability to summon diverse weather phenomena, from blizzards to thunderstorms, a power that truly encapsulates their dominion over the forces of nature. Their tribal totem, Wendigo, the cannibal spirit of winter, symbolizes their resilience and ferocity. Their association with spirits of ice, storm, and hunger further speaks to their tribal identity and their connection to the harsh, unforgiving elements of nature. The Wendigo tribe is a symbol of resilience, fierce independence, and a profound, if somewhat rigid, commitment to tradition and purity. 
They are survivors, willing to face the harshest conditions and fight fiercely to preserve their way of life. However, their intolerance and insularity could prove to be their downfall if they, if they do not find a way to balance their commitment to purity with the need for cooperation and understanding. The Black Spiral Dancers are a grim reminder of what can happen when one strays too far from their path, succumbing to corruption and darkness. I've seen my fair share of such transformations, and it's never a pleasant sight. It's a tragic tale, the fall of the White Howlers, a warning about the dangers of arrogance and overconfidence. I empathize with their fate, despite the atrocities they commit in their current state. Their transformation from the White Howlers to the Black Spiral Dancers is a stark example of the dire consequences of delving too deep into realms best left untouched. Their descent into madness is a grim testimony to the corruptive power of the Worm. This tribe, once famed for their fury and brutal rituals, has now become an embodiment of unreasoning hatred and insanity. Even though they've lost much of their original identity, they still possess some semblance of organization. Their hives, toxic wastelands, and hidden subterranean tunnels are reminiscent of the Kyorns of other tribes, though twisted and corrupted. Their orgiastic rituals and public ordeals of victimization reflect the depth of their corruption, and their allegiance to the Hydra heads of the Triadic Worm is a clear sign of their abandonment of Gaia's teachings, their acceptance of Metis, normally shunned by other tribes, is a sharp contrast to their Garu counterparts. While other tribes view Metis as symbols of violation against the Litany, the Black Spiral Dancers embrace them, bolstering their numbers and further alienating themselves from the rest of the Garu. The appearance of the Black Spiral Dancers, with their filthy and gnarled fur and burning unnatural eyes, is a physical manifestation of their inner corruption. Their kinfolk and territory are just as twisted, with sanity rare among them and their living conditions often squalid. The Black Spiral Dancers, twisted by the corruption of the Worm, possess a terrifying arsenal of gifts that reflect their sinister purpose and unholy alliances. At the very initiation of their tribal journey, they undergo a soul-shattering experience in the Black Spiral Labyrinth, learning their first tribal gift. As they ascend in rank, they continue to acquire new gifts, each more frightening than the last. Some gifts allow them to bind Banes in a pact of mutual alliance call upon elemental forces corrupted by the worm, or manipulate others' perceptions to mask the horrors they perpetrate. Their abilities are a grotesque mirror of the natural gifts possessed by Gai and Garu. They can harden their skin into a leathery hide, resist pain and toxins, and sense the presence of other worm creatures. They can also manipulate their bodies in horrific ways, growing bat-like ears for echolocation, or sprouting membranous wings for flight. They can inflict frenzies on their victims, infect others with a slow-acting poison, or even project balefire, a corrosive mutating flame. These are just a few examples of their perverse powers. Each Black Spiral Dancer's arsenal is unique, shaped by their own individual journeys through the labyrinth and their service to the worm. Their tribal totem, the Whippoorwill, is fitting for them. A spirit of misfortune and ruin, it mirrors their current state perfectly. They are a tribe lost to darkness, a stark warning to other Garu of the terrible fate that awaits those who succumb to the Worm's corruption. The Black Spiral Dancers are a tragic example of the destructive power of the Worm, and serve as a grim reminder to all Garu of the dangers of straying too far from their path. They represent the worst possible outcome for any werewolf, a fate to be avoided at all costs. As my time with the Garu tribe nears its end, I am brought once more to the tent of Moonsong Weaver the tribe's storyteller and my guide in this strange new world. Our conversations have woven a rich tapestry of the history and culture of the Guru, and as I prepare to set off into the unknown, she brings me to discuss the greatest threat I'll face, the Worm. The Worm is the embodiment of corruption, despair, and destruction. As a Witcher, I've encountered many malevolent entities, but the Worm sounds like a force of a different magnitude. Its influence is not just physical, but spiritual and metaphysical seeping into the very essence of existence. That's a level of insidiousness that's truly horrifying. Each aspect of the worm, from the beast of war to the eater of souls and the defiler worm, represents a different facet of destruction and chaos. It's not merely satisfied with physical destruction or death. The worm aims to corrupt and defile, to consume everything that exists. Its minions, the Banes, are a testament to its corrupting influence. These spirits, either born of the worm or thoroughly corrupted by it, are the embodiment of its destructive nature. Their ability to influence and possess the weak and vulnerable is a chilling thought. 
the fact that they can manifest in countless forms, from perverted spirits of animals and elements to symbolic embodiments of sin and horror, makes them a formidable and terrifying enemy. The worm and its banes are unlike anything I've encountered in my travels. They're not just monsters or malevolent spirits. They're a pervasive force of corruption and destruction, a spiritual blight that threatens to consume everything in its path. The concept of such an entity is disconcerting. It's a force that seems to be everywhere and nowhere at once, an insidious threat that can't be fought with a silver sword or a sign. In my experience, the most dangerous foes are those that cannot be seen or easily fought. The worm fits this description perfectly. It's an enemy that requires not just strength and skill to combat, but resilience, willpower, and an unwavering dedication to resist its corrupting influence. In essence, the worm is the epitome of all that is wrong in this world. It represents the ultimate challenge for any who stand against the forces of corruption and destruction. It's an adversary that demands respect, even from a seasoned witcher like me. This world, foreign and perilous as it may be, presents opportunities for exploration, for evolution. I am accustomed to peculiar lands and unusual creatures. I have confronted terrors that would make the stoutest hearts quail, and yet I have also witnessed marvels that few can even imagine. The Garu have been hospitable, and my understanding has expanded in their presence. Their bond with Gaia, their dogged resolve to shield their world from the worm, it's inspiring, albeit in a unique way. I part ways with them carrying a heavy heart, but also a sense of anticipation. The path untraveled beckons, and I am obliged to heed its call. These fera they refer to, other beings in tune with the land, they hold a compelling allure. Could they possess the solutions I am seeking? Could they navigate me back to my realm? It's a risk, undeniably, but then existence as a witcher is a gamble in itself. A last glance at the guru, their intense gazes meeting mine, a quiet comprehension exchanged. We are not so dissimilar, they and I. Both products of a brutal world, both fighters, survivors. Ahead lies the unknown, a world teeming with novel creatures, new trials, new enigmas to unravel. I can only hope that this new path will lead me back to where I belong, to the windswept plains of Temeria, to the halls of Kaer Morhen, to the world I know. But for now it's time to explore, to learn, to adapt. After all, it's what witchers do best, 